so in the end of the Sabbath, it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy. And they did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet. They worshipped him. Then said Jesus, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And they saw him and worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And so, as I did this morning, I'd like to expatiate tonight on this same text I found uh, in preparation for the Lord's Day. As I said this morning, you know, so I've preached Easter Sundays for 49 years. So, uh, like Christmas, you know, it becomes like rote after a while. You have to be very careful. I, I'm not interested in delivering leftovers. So he said, Lord, now what new thing can I see in this text? But you know there's always some new thing. It's just, it's an amazing book. And so uh, I focused on this. Now, of course, I had seen it before. And, uh, you know, if you go through the scholastic notes on this, you've got varying opinions about who they were that doubted. Who was this? Well, the Bible only tells us the 11. Uh, were there others there? There are those that maintain this was the meeting that Jesus had with 500 uh, that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, but doesn't say that. Uh, this is the meeting that was supposed to happen Easter evening, from what I understand. Go tell my disciples that I'm meeting them at Galilee. And they go back and tell the disciples, but the disciples are hidden up in the upper room. They're not about to leave the upper room. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus has to actually go and meet them on Easter evening in the upper room. But that wasn't really the, uh, the tryst was to be at, the, uh, at Galilee. But uh, they, they didn't make it there. But they ultimately did make it there. And so that's what we're seeing here. In a sense, uh, we have a compressed version that Matthew gives us. He compresses time together here. There's 40 days that are involved in all of this. You want to keep all of that in mind. And when you try to harmonize the four accounts, you'll need some space of time here. There are places where Jesus has to be. The Sea of Galilee, according to John 21, he's going to be there, certainly. He has to be on the road to Emmaus Easter evening. He has to be in the upper room Easter evening. So to kind of put it all together, I, I, I speak of it like a Rubik's Cube. You know, you try to put all the facts together and it's not easy, but there must be a way that it all fits back together. So this account seems to be there on the, 
they're on the uh, the mount at this point they're they're where Jesus said to meet and this is probably several weeks after the initial meeting and in fact here he gives the Great Commission but we know that this is not the place where he gave the final instructions which would be the Mount of Olives so we're, we're you know 90 miles away from it so so this must have been kind of a reiteration of the Great Commission uh, and so perhaps there were many times that he gave them that you know even in the upper room uh, he breathed on them and said uh, receive you my spirit so send I you so that's that's a form of the Great Commission isn't it so at any rate we find this curious expression this admixture of worship and doubting at the same time now certainly everybody in the room can sympathize with the situation because we're not all as true as we would pretend to be and we come to church on Sunday and we're all fine and respectable Christian people but some of us doubt some of you doubt you've had your doubts and uh, that's where the devil comes in if you're a young person in particular he'll be attacking you with his pitchfork until you finally get settled in and I want to tell you here and perhaps that's the only reason I remain here speaking uh, nine years after my stroke when I talk, well, we talk like that and I, I didn't know whether I'd ever talk again and I said Lord you know it's up to you but I, I really I have more things to say and so he fixed me up and uh, so I, I could keep talking but the devil would like to silence me I'm sure of that I'm, I'm pretty sure of that one but maybe I'm here to help you you know I'm that old uh, engineer that's building the bridge for the young right to go across and I want to build a bridge for you and I want to tell you you met a man here you heard a man week after week who was totally confident that what God said is the truth that we live without wavering God has said it and I believe it and that's good enough for me all the sophistical arguments that could ever be hurled against our great gospel in Christ I've heard them and I denounce them as I did this morning I don't care what mouth it comes from in the, in the case this morning it was Bill O'Reilly's mouth with his uh, blasphemous book killing Jesus and so on this is blasphemy to me and he said well I'm a good Catholic I don't care what you are and you're telling me you know more about it and of course he said you know that he had done a lot of research that's why he could he was telling you things you nobody had ever heard before because he he actually had a crew and they went to Jerusalem they, they talked to Peter John I, I guess I don't know how could he knew so so much and I mean these sophistical intellectual idiots but you know the devil can use anybody to to bring us his direction you know the uh, the ways of Satan are quite subtle as a matter of fact and uh, every one of us here have had a conversation with him I, I can guarantee it but perhaps the Lord left me here to be a witness and to tell you with certitude that what he has said is the truth and what he has said will come to pass every jot and tittle of it all right so what do we see but this uh, admixture of worshipers and doubters on this hill in Galilee so uh, are there 11 are there more than 11 who cares all I can tell you is probably even amongst them for a long while when I looked at the text I said well you know this is kind of an oblique reference to Thomas doubting Thomas or maybe even as we saw this morning you know the uh, disciples themselves when Mary comes with the news that he's risen they don't believe they, it's, it's an idle tale you know this is the way of the Lord by the way it, it doesn't it, not many mighty not many wise right he chooses the foolish things to confound the wise and the weak things to confound the things which are mighty things which are not to bring to not things which are so so why so all glory goes to God that's why so so the point is that why would you choose women to carry the message no offense to the ladies here but we're really living in a completely different age than the first century and women were not even accepted in the courtrooms for a witness they were just not considered reliable and so what does God say he said uh, well okay who's going to give the first message of Christ risen from the dead he'll put it in the mouth not only of women but a woman who had seven devils in her 
So not a prostitute, but she was a lunatic. I can tell you that with seven devils, you talk out of your head. You, you speak like an idiot. And, and so Jesus, I, I think we'll choose you. You go tell the rest that I'm risen. And so, of course, it makes it even in a sense for those disciples. Here comes Mary in the room. Uh, the door is all locked and so forth. And she comes running and he is risen. I've seen him. And she's all excited about it. Can you imagine having that news? Like it's brimming on your lips. You can't wait to tell the next person. Uh, the light is in your heart and you want to you give the gospel out. And you've given the gospel out. And, and here you have 11 incredulous disciples not believing a word of it. Idle tales, they said. Just, uh, you know, fascinations of a woman. You know, emotion. She needs to settle down a little bit, cool her. You know, she's maybe reverting back to the old life a little bit, you know, when she was uh, schizophrenic. With seven devils, you'd have to be. But no, no, no. It was the truth. And there was enough compelling evidence that Peter and John said, let's go down and see what's happened. And once they go down, they become believers, don't they? All right, so they worshipped him, but some doubted. And we mentioned this morning this uh, vitally important thing to make sure that you're on the worshiper side of things. There is this delineation throughout the Bible, my friends. The Bible is binary. It's black and white. There is no question about the fact that a line is drawn. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either the good fish or the bad fish in the parables. You're either the wheat or you're the tares. You're either sheep or you're goats. You either follow Christ or you follow the devil. You either go to heaven when you die or you go to hell when you die. And so, the king will say unto those in his right hand, he says, come, my blessed of my father, and come and inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. But of course, on his left hand, he'll say to them, depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. So those are, the, uh, those are the options. So I would say, well, we've got to put away our doubts. And we have to resolve our doubts. Since after all, and listen, what a curse it is in many ways. Aptitude can be a curse. Now, you know, it, it can, it's a two-edged sword. Obviously, it can be a great blessing, too. Amen. One that has the gift of aptitude, the ability to think and think deeper thoughts. Uh, and has a higher IQ, that person can be a great benefit for the kingdom of God. We need a few geniuses. But it's also a curse, because along with it, the analytical mind isn't satisfied with what they consider to be superficial answers to questions. They've got a lot more questions. I like the difference between Philip and Nathaniel, right? So Philip hears the gospel. I don't know, there's not much told us about Philip, but I'm going to imagine, you know, he has a Greek name, so that means to me, maybe uh, more of a, in a common background, most of the apostles were, after all. Nathaniel does seem to be scholastic. And so, uh, here, we, we, here comes Philip, the common man, to address the academic. And uh, says to him in the first chapter, now we've got, we found the Messiah, we found him, and and Nathaniel said, who is it? Well, Jesus of, of Nazareth, of Galilee. Uh, well, well, he doesn't know this. Uh, the prophets don't come out of this. And, and our king is coming from Bethlehem. And, you know, he, he knew all of that. But apparently Philip didn't. And he's, he's posing these questions. And Philip has no answer to it. And you know what Philip says at the end? Come and see. So the analytical mind needed more evidence than the simple mind. Now believe me, when I say simple, I'm not using that in any way as a pejorative term. The simple people have a much easier path to heaven. The simple people. Don't be complaining that you don't seem to understand everything or you don't get it right away or you seem to be thick or simple. <laughs> You're the, heaven will be filled with folk like that. So if you have a more analytical mind, that can be a stumbling block to you. It really can so we have to put away all of those reasonable doubts that you may have and take the leap of faith and trust that even though you don't understand, you will believe as a child believes to enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so it is a forever experience, a forever and ever experience. You see the difference between the worshipers, they shall reign forever and ever, 
and the doubters. The smoke of their torment will rise up forever and ever. There will be no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image. Matthew tells us the king will say unto his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. But on the left he'll say, Depart from me, ye cursed. Here again, this line is clearly delineated, and it will be in eternity. Uh, in the Gospel of John, the, the uh, central theme has to be believe. Belief. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And in the same breath, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So, these two eternities are awaiting those. It was Moses that actually laid forth the prospects of a, a, a choice that must be made. Now, poor Moses had never, he never heard the Calvinist argument, so he's, he's actually telling them to choose something, <laughs> you know. Uh, he and Joshua didn't know any better, I suppose, that it was already elected, and nobody can choose anything, we don't have a free will, but they seem to understand, right? So he says, I call heaven and earth to re record this day against you. I've set before you life and death. I choose blessing and blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live forever. So, uh, and you know, I mentioned Joshua as well. So Joshua 24, 15 uh, speaks of the same choice that you must make. All right, so we're going to move uh, into the the text a little bit further here, this idea of doubters and worshipers appearing almost at the, at the same time. We have this stark contrast of the saved and the lost, right? And we would have to go to the table at this point. And so we go to the table, and what do we find at the table? But the devil, the devil's at the table. And the doubters, in this case, it's Judas Iscariot. And this doubter, the Lord knows all about this. And uh, on one side, the doubter, with the devil whispering in his ear, and on the other side is John the Beloved. Look at the contrast, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Uh, and when Jesus had uh, thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Every one of them was gripped with a certain amount of guilt here. How many times did they think about quitting? In the early days, it was easy to follow Jesus. Miracles abounded. The teachings of Christ proliferated. The multitudes uh, were, seemed to be carrying Jesus all the way to the gates of Jerusalem to uh, crown him as the king. So that was easy. That's what we call the years of his popularity. But the years of popularity, well, that, that popularity wanes. And what do we find happening? That as the later teachings come, they're harder teachings. Fewer miracles. And so, somewhere along the line, even Peter accosts Jesus and said, we've left family and business. We've left everything. What, what, what we have? What we have at the end of this? In other words, when's the kingdom going to come? They were signed on for the kingdom. This was the king, and he was bringing the kingdom. And that is what the promise was, or so they thought. They're simple people too, but they knew enough of the messianic hope to cling to it. They, along with Joseph and Mary, and Joseph of Arimathea, and Joseph, uh, these uh, individuals waited for the coming of the kingdom. And Simeon and Anna. So... So when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, they're all doubting because they've all thought of it, I think, in their hearts. They thought of giving up. Now all these years of ministry and how many people we've seen that have come and gone. They're here for a while, they're gone. And uh, I mean, I contacted dozens of them this week and uh, they, they weren't here this morning as far as I could see. And that saddens me. Because I can remember the zeal they had. I can remember that uh, the incipient days of their conversion, or seeming conversion, their excitement for the master. And uh, what happened to them? At some point, they took their hand off the plow. I don't think they lost their salvation, 
I don't think, as Jesus said, he doesn't commit himself immediately to people. They're willing right away, but he doesn't commit himself. He knows the tests are coming, and those tests will prove whether or not this is a true faith or not. And so, that must have been the case at the table. Each one of them thinking, he could be talking about me. That's amazing to me. Most of them, you would think right away, Judas. You would think they knew that. But that's not what it seems here. In fact, Peter even motions to John, you're closer to Jesus than I am. Ask him who it is. So they're not aware of who the betrayer is. And so they're sitting amongst them. This perfidious traitor, Judas Iscariot, and yet he appears to be one of the twelve. So Jesus says a very troubling thing at that point. And so they all began doubting of whom he spake. And uh, Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Of course, this is whispered. John is the one that asks the question and Jesus gives him the answer here. You see in the 23rd and 25th verse that John is leaning on his breast at this point, whispering. He's, and he answers, it is he to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, and again, this is whispered, that thou doest, do quickly. And he leaves the room at that point. No one wondering why. Some thinking, well, he has the bag. He's the treasurer. He's going to go out and buy some supplies or give some money to the poor, whatever they thought. Well, I said, look, just as our text, we have those that worship and those that doubt. Right at the table, and uh, in this particular picture, they're pictured right next to each other, and, and I guess everybody thinks that da Vinci knew what the guest order was. The only order we really know would be John. John was closest to Jesus, and he leaned upon his breast. But we would have to think Judas must have been right by there, close enough for Jesus to dip the sop. So... So what do we have here? We have the, the worshiper and, of course, the, uh, the doubter is Judas Iscariot. So now uh, there was uh, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, and uh, leaning on the breast, uh, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Here's another illustration of this, what almost be, seems to be contradictory terms. So we have Joseph of Arimathea. He was a good man and just same had not consented to the council and deed of them. Thank God for the parenthesis. It explains so much. Because we wonder. We thought maybe is there unanimity amongst the Sanhedrin? So there's, uh, let us put the number at 70, but uh, they had a quorum at least. And they gather in here illegally in the middle of the night. There must be an emergent, emergency uh, meeting that we have to call and convene for some great reason. They had to put Jesus to death. They didn't realize it. He had to be put to death when the Passover lambs were being put to death. So they had to be about their business here. But we often wonder, was there any protest? Didn't anybody stand up for Jesus in that crowd? And we can think of at least two, and perhaps there were more even, that were in that august uh, retinue of uh, elders. And so we have in the midst of them a good man and a just man and one that would not consent to the death of Jesus. And we also had the doubters. They were those that doubted he wasn't the son of God. They thought to themselves, and how could this man, carpenter's son, and how could he, he's unschooled, how could he be the king of kings and the lord of lords? You just saw him coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, so... To them it was impossible and preposterous. They were sure that crucifying him as a blasphemer was right in the sight of God. We can sometimes be so wrong. There's another little wrinkle in our teaching I'd like to take at this point, And that is when doubters are changed to shouters, right? When doubters become worshipers. And we see this uh, in this particular... In Matthew be of good cheer, 40. be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid.
Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Come. little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So Peter, a doubter, you know, he had that moment and uh, lapse of faith and begins to sink. But Jesus pulls him up, brings him to the ship, and then all that are on the ship do worship him. And so we see this, you know, it's a wonderful, almost contradictory kind of a, a scene here. Doubt mingled with rejoicing and true worship. At the cross we see it as well. We will note at the cross in Luke 23's account, and the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Now, this is nothing more than uh, aping whatever they were hearing from the priests and so on. If thou be the son of God. And so the soldiers, what do they know? And so they, did, they didn't know anything about Jesus in a sense. But now, of course, they just pick it up. And this is what evil people do. You don't want to be like the rest of the world, what they're saying and the language they use and whatever else. No, 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 no. You're, you're a peculiar person. You speak differently. You act differently. Uh, but you see how easy it is to mimic, especially when it comes to mockery. Uh, you can pick it up so easily. And so the, uh, they begin mocking Jesus, and I think uh, the soldiers picked it up at this point. They're probably half drunk with the sapa that they were using at that point and gambling I mean this is all going on at the feet of Jesus and the soldiers mocked him coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying if thou be the son the king of the Jews save thyself and so obviously they are doubting him but then something wonderful happens we'll take it to the meridian there's six hours of crucifixion that's involved the Bible speaks of the third hour is when it begins from six in the morning till nine in the morning. That's six in the morning is the first hour of the day. Jewish time's a little different than we're used to. And all the way now it says to the sixth hour. And at the sixth hour, the sun now is darkened. What a chilling experience it must be for people seeing this happen. There'll be those that try to explain it away as an eclipse, but we've learned so much by now in our modern society that we realize uh, at that particular time, of the month it could not have happened it could not coincide with Passover that needed the full moon and so forth and the juxtaposition of the sun the moon and the earth uh, just opposite to what was necessary for an eclipse not only that but an eclipse only lasts for minutes certainly not three hours so perhaps the people understood remember Romans were pretty much superstitious and to realize this is happening it, it, uh, it brought fear to them I think the mockery was over at this point and now they were wondering about it. Then the earth begins to tremble beneath their feet. Then they're all terror in, in their hearts. What, what is going on here? I think lightning bolts are flashing and so forth. And these that were previous mockers and doubters. Suddenly Matthew tells us the centurion. And they that were with him watching Jesus. Saw the earthquake. And those things that were done. They feared greatly saying. Truly, this was the Son of God. So the doubters became 
worshipers. What a delight it'll be to meet these people in heaven. The man that had the hammer and held the nail and drove it through the hands of Jesus. That, that man that had to live the rest of his life ruining that scene, probably replaying it over and over again in his mind, what, what did I do? But understanding, because they watched Jesus, they watched him, they watched how he responded, how he reacted, and where his thoughts were. In most cases, one would be in complete derision. This was a terrible moment here for them. They'd be uh, thinking, uh, hallucinating, and having uh, their mind completely out of sorts, saying stupid things pro probably and perhaps especially the thieves who would think they've been intoxicated now with the wine mingled with gall, but not Jesus. Jesus speaks with celerity. He even speaks with a loud voice, despite what Bill O'Reilly said this morning. You know, they wouldn't be able to say these words that Jesus couldn't say and didn't say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Bill said, no, we interviewed John and James, and they said he didn't say it. Whatever. What? I mean, lunacy. A bestseller book, people go buy it and so on and read it and say, I didn't know that. Well, you didn't know it because it's not the truth. It's just, a, it's just nothing but a book full of lies making this man a multimillionaire, which he already was anyway. I mean, the whole thing disgusts me, what people will do for money. At any rate, I think of these, these pagan soldiers the centurion in charge of all of this. Uh, I mean, we're not sure that, was this the same centurion that asked Jesus for the favor to heal his servant? This we don't know. There were many centurions. But if he was in charge of the, uh, of the retinue that came up to crucify Jesus, something dramatically changed in his heart for him to make this attestation. This is the Son of God. Remember, all he could see is this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. He understood that this was the son of God. Marvelous conversions. These are the things that excite our soul. And when we think of people that you say, you know, they're just too far gone. They're not hearing us. They won't listen to us. And it's an impossible case. We get this all the time. We hear this. And hear it. And so can you imagine their skin is crawling at this point? <laughs> And doubting about what, what is this all about? What is this supposed to mean when Jesus said, have you here any meat? And he sat them down. And they're thinking, it, it's Jesus. And, uh, and perhaps they're even touching him. You know, he's not a spirit. And a spirit can't eat. And, well, suddenly it says that then they, they believe not for joy, right? While they... Uh, uh, they yet believed not for joy. So there's still, a bit, there's still this element of doubt in them. But they become true worshipers. Because after they have their little dinner, Jesus opens unto them the scriptures. And this is what solidifies a person. It's why the devil doesn't want you to read your Bible. Certainly doesn't want you to memorize it. Doesn't want you to know it. Doesn't want you to hear the preaching of the gospel. Will give you every reason not to come to church, as a matter of fact. Because of the power of the word. Because once a person is rooted and grounded, the devil has a hard time getting in. Oh, he'll find a way, but it'll be much, much harder. He opened unto them the scriptures concerning himself. Their minds are settled, and they worship the Lord on Easter evening. But there was one absent in the room that night, the doubter. Imagine all of your life that they hang that appellation on you, doubting Thomas or doubting whatever your name is. I mean, the poor guy, give him a break. He actually said he would go and die to, with Jesus. He was the first to say it. I'll go with you to Jerusalem. You're going to die there? I'll die with you. That was a shining moment. But now, of course, it was a little different. Now he's receiving the gospel secondhand. And just like uh, those citizens that came out, the woman at the well said, I found Messiah. He told me all things ever I did. And uh, they didn't believe for her word. They went for themselves. 
to find out and they were satisfied. So the, the, other, the, the other ten told him, Thomas, well, we know we saw him. He's appeared to us. He ate with us. He opened the scriptures to us. We doubted, but now we believe. But Thomas says, I, I, I still doubt. So Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. I believe in free will and so does God. And Thomas was exercising it. And after eight days again, disciples were with him and uh, Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach forth, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And what a great moment this is. You know, there's the song that we uh, sing, crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side and wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. So Thomas answered and said unto him, I'm no longer a doubter. I'm a shouter now, right? I'm a worshiper. Thomas said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, right, Alice? They look at this one and they say, well, he was just cursing. He was just cursing, saying, my Lord and my God. They just can't, they have a hard time with Jesus being the same as God. I and my Father are one. They have a hard time with it. I have a hard time rationally with it. I don't have a problem in the world by faith, that's for sure. It just erases all those rational arguments and so forth. My Lord and my God. I mean, what an attestation here. Now, Jesus could have said, now, wait a minute, I'm not God. But he didn't say that. He received it. And because thou hast seen me, and thou hast believed. Well, he said, blessed are they, he's talking about us, isn't he? That have not seen, and yet have believed. That's us. That's a beatitude for us. Who have exercised faith without seeing. Now there's another doubter that became a shouter. And it was the brother of Jesus. We call him James the Just. Now there's, it's confusing. There's a number of Jameses that are involved. But James the Just is the writer of the epistle. He, along with Jude, are brothers to Jesus. And they didn't believe in him. They doubted him. It seems impossible, doesn't it? But it was so. But a prophet in his own land is without honor, Jesus said. And those of your own household. <laughs> so away with the nonsense that they have in these uh, pseudepigraphical writings about the childhood of Jesus performing miracles, you know, lifting up a cart when he was three years old so that Joseph could put a wheel on it, and all this nonsense that people buy into. Jesus did none of that. He lived in obscurity. And then suddenly he emerges at the River Jordan, anointed by the Holy Ghost, and everything's different. And now a proliferation of miracles wherever he goes. But then he was he had left home. James and Jude and the other brothers and sisters knew him as a brother and that's all they knew about him. Didn't realize much other than that. Now how do I know this? Well there's this verse in John. The Jews feast of tabernacles was at hand and his brethren therefore said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea. Thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things Show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. 
John gives us the insight. They were saying, we haven't seen you do any miracles. Neither anybody in Jerusalem. You do all of this in a place where nobody, you know, there aren't any television cameras. So we don't have any record of it. All we have is word of mouth. If you're really who you are claiming to be, prove it. They didn't believe in him either. Isn't that sad? They were doubters. You'll see this also in Mark chapter 3 with uh, this expression that we're going to have to give you some teaching on. So when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. These friends are his brothers, his siblings. Uh, now, how do I know that? Well, it's, the, it's an archaic expression to some degree, but a para autos, right? Where it is. Okay, and literally they who were from beside him is what this expression means in the Greek. They who were from beside him. Now you could certainly say that that's a close friend. But you can see here that we've got by origin or birth, his mother and brethren is how it's explained. And uh, so, I mean, we basically we're going here to Vincent's word studies, which are excellent the Greek studies. And, uh, and so we begin to see here something uh, to this expression. It's actually his brethren, his friends. Remember the expression friends, brethren. Uh, Jesus employs it when he speaks of the disciples. They're not his kindred, but he speaks of them as brethren. And you and I speak in that term as well. So you can see there's an interchangeability to the words. Okay, at any rate. So... Uh, then his brethren and his mother, you see that, are standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and uh, they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And you'll remember that Jesus rebuffs them. He answered and said, Who is my mother? Who is my brethren? And he looked round about, and he said, These which are about him, and said, Behold, these are my mother and my brethren. So we begin to understand something about this idea. Uh, and whosoever shall do the will of God the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. So here again, uh, we, we know that Jesus, that Mary and Joseph had other uh, uh, siblings here, brethren. His brethren James and Joseph and J Simon and Judas, Jude is how we abbreviate it, and his sisters. And they, uh, not, uh, are they not all with us? Uh, so we, we understand this, and this was, of course, his own house. All right. Um, so what happens to this doubter, James? The Lord appears to him. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us that insight there. so valuable to us. And so James the just gets his own little visit with his brother. And after his resurrection, he becomes a worshiper. And becomes an author to uh, the book of James. So, and we're glad it all worked out. Uh, well, we could certainly say as well, after all of this, Saul of Tarsus, uh, one of the great proofs that the Bible was not an invention, was the fact that Saul of Tarsus became a believer. And here he was, carting people off, taking them, arresting them, persecuting them. As you well know, Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he might be found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound. And so he becomes the worshiper on the road to Damascus. And the Lord smites him off of his horse. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the prince. And he becomes that firebrand in the, in the hands of the Lord. I want to close with, um, what do I have, seven minutes? I don't know, this is an if case. Pontius Pilate, converted to Christ. I'd like to think that. It's just like Jesus. It would be just like him to save the man that condemned him to death. So, so I don't have a problem with him being converted. I don't know if there's any evidence. So all we can do now, certainly the Bible doesn't indicate much that would lead us to say, Pontius Pilate was actually converted. We do know he was favorable towards Christ. He showed him favors. Believe it or not, even in the whipping, 
all that was designed to elicit some sympathy from the mob and hopefully they'd say well that's enough you know you beat him up he thinks he's a king and he's just deluded Pilate thought that would placate them and that would be enough uh, but that wasn't enough as you well know the story now you can go to apostolic writings uh, what's called the patristic writings or the fathers generally and we have um, Oh, I tell you what, what a repository of historical valuable information we have in the Church Fathers. It's a collection of writings collated in a uh, uh, volume of about this long. And uh, you have all the various writings that you could ever want from the first three centuries of Christianity. And you can read what they were thinking during that time. And so uh, some of this is called from that. Early Christians began to build legends around Pilate's apparent unwillingness to condemn Jesus. From the second century onward, we hear apocryphal tales relating how Pilate not only recognized Jesus' innocence, but also his divinity. Tertullian wrote uh, that uh, Pilate became a Christian, convert, and even tried to persuade the emperor Tiberius to the faith. I mean, that's incredible. Now, of course, we've got to remember these writings are not inspired by God. And so, in a sense, it's a form of hearsay. How would Tertullian actually know that? He's separated by a century of time. So uh, it would have been word of mouth. At any rate, it's a curious thing. I say it would be just like the Lord to do such a thing. Then the fourth century church historian Eusebius says that though Tiberius remained a pagan, he was sufficiently impressed by Pilate's testimony that he urged the Roman Senate to add Jesus to the official pantheon. Tiberius made any attack on Christians punishable by death. However, his successor Caligula was not similarly swayed and ordered Pilate to commit suicide. Bishop Irenaeus of Lyons relates that the sect of the Carpathians <laughs> possessed an image of Jesus painted by Pilate himself. So again, these are, take it for what it's worth. Uh, there was even in circulation a document called the Acts of Pilate, which implied that Pilate was an instrument of God for allowing Jesus to die. This 5th century fabrication also unmistakably shows Pilate expressing genuine sympathy for the grief-stricken Jews who did not want Jesus crucified. St. Augustine numbers Pilate among the prophets in one of his sermons. Early Christian artists likened him to Old Testament heroes, Daniel and Abraham. Pilate's refusal to condemn Jesus was paralleled with Daniel's refusal to condemn Susanna. Abraham leading Isaac as a sacrificial offering was mirrored in Pilate's leading Christ to his atoning death. Historians theorize that the Gospels downplayed Pilate's role in the trial of Jesus in order to conciliate uh, the Romans to the uh, new religion. With the conversion of numerous Romans culminating in Constantine's acceptance of Christianity, Pilate became the model of a Roman who refused to persecute Christians. He was proof that the Romans were instrumental to the plan of salvation. Now, no one knows what happened to Pilate after his dismissal. One old tradition says that he killed himself. Eusebius records that Pilate committed suicide out of remorse for his part in Jesus' execution. But the Ethiopian church believes the former prefect was martyred and was canonized him and uh, declared June 25th as his feast day. So, uh, at any rate, so I called all that from, I think that came from um, International Bible Encyclopedia, that quote. I just bring it to light. I mean, that would be the ultimate, so to speak, in um, one who was a doubter and said, what is truth? And then perhaps that icy stare, you know, of the Lord. Uh, it had to be, it had to, had to be a, a, a frightening feeling to stand in the presence of the Lord uh, and start your silly, sophistical argument, you know, well, what is truth? You know, to ask stupid questions like that in the face of one who is the truth incarnate. So, I don't know what to make of all of this, but it would be a delight, wouldn't it, to think of Pontius Pilate in heaven. Well, Lord, you did say long ago, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Pilate could certainly come under that heading. So, Lord, uh, 
Oh, how we thank you for Easter. This time, Lord, that uh, even unsaved people come running into church. Now, we're always glad to see them, Lord, but truly, we pray that you'd speak to their hearts, Lord. Certainly, they heard the truth today, and we need them, Lord, to bow the knee and to believe. I pray, Lord, that that message will ruminate in their heart and mind, that you might even trouble them tonight about what they heard today. I know if I was in this room unsaved and heard about a burning hell and that my doubts would take me there, I would do all that I could to resolve those doubts. Unfortunately, Lord, because of the skeptical generation that we live in, people don't even bother exploring the possibility. They dismiss it immediately. And Satan has so many amusements, so many diversions, so many external thoughts to drive us into other areas and to contemplate other things that really have no eternal merit. Oh God, open eyes. Bring people out of darkness into your marvelous light. Be pleased, Lord, to use us as your instruments that we could open our mouth and declare what we know to be the truth. Lord, we live in perilous times as you predicted. Men are indeed lovers of themselves, proud and boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, and the lot, Lord. We're living in a time, Lord, where we, uh, we fear for our children and grandchildren as they grow up in this insanity. But Lord, we're the salt of the earth. We're hoping, Lord, well, the fact that we're still here would indicate that the salt hasn't lost all of its savor. May we be a light brilliantly shining in the midst of this perverse darkness and that you'll call some out of that darkness, Lord. Oh, use us, we pray, Lord. Revive your church and help us, Lord, to give uh, no thinking to the doubts that Satan would put in our minds. For that is just an endless uh, pattern it, it takes us away from faithful thinking and we ask Lord that you'll deliver us from these evil machinations that you'll help us Father to be resolute convicted that we will do our part Lord to nourish ourselves in the word and to establish ourselves on this sure foundation now bless us as we leave here Lord we take uh, Resurrection Sunday with us wherever we go and we'll continue to celebrate it every time these doors are open in Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. 
On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Lord Jesus.